Now, joining us on the virtual stage, DARPA Microsystems Technology Office Deputy Director, Dr. Dev Palmer. Good morning. I'm Dev Palmer, Deputy Director of MTO, and I'd like to welcome you to day two of the ERI Summit and MTO Symposium. Yesterday, Dr. Carl McCants brought us up to date on where ERI stands now and on the research areas that are under consideration for the future of microelectronics. ERI was started as a five-year program, and with a little more than a year left to go, we're distilling these considerations into action plans. Carl mentioned extreme environmental electronics and manufacturing complex 3D microsystems as two of the new research areas. Today, I'll talk about extreme environmental electronics, and tomorrow you'll hear more on manufacturing from Dr. Rosker. So what does the word environment mean to the DOD? For the purposes of assessing the reliability and functionality of electronics, MIL Standard 883 defines the environment as the natural elements and conditions surrounding military and space operations that could have deleterious effects on electronic systems. To be certain, the warfighters' operating environments are more extreme than what most of us would encounter, say, on the drive to the office or even on a drive around the world. Today's military conducts missions on the ground, on and under the sea surface, in the air, and with the addition of the U.S. Space Force to the edges of cislunar space. And the electronic systems needed to accomplish these missions must operate without fail in cold weather, in hot weather, in an electrical storm, in the air, on or under the sea or in space, in a tank, jet, helicopter, submarine, or aircraft carrier, on a satellite or inside a missile. But so far, we're talking about electronic systems that can tolerate extreme environments. What about electronics that are designed to thrive in extreme environments? When thinking about DOD electronics for extreme environments, I tend to focus on three elements and conditions in particular, high radiation, extreme temperature, and high power. Each of these elements and conditions present their own unique challenges and opportunities. First, let's talk about radiation-tolerant electronics. Radiation damage can be caused by energetic particles and high-intensity electromagnetic fields, resulting in effects ranging from resets and failures from glitchy signal spikes and noise to physical damage and system shutdown. For example, in 1989, a geomagnetic storm damaged satellites, caused a sensor malfunction on the Space Shuttle Discovery, and blacked out a power grid in Quebec. The blackout happened in 90 seconds, but the effects persisted for many hours. Environments with high levels of radiation can be natural. Lightning strikes, the Van Allen radiation belts, solar flares, and cosmic rays originating outside our solar system, or produced by human activity. High energy physics labs, nuclear reactors, and the intense electromagnetic pulse from a nuclear explosion. Generally speaking, Electronics used in these environments have to have the same functionality as any other electronics. We have a pretty good handle on the effects of ionizing radiation on the older CMOS nodes, which is where most of the current technology exists, but little is known about how more advanced silicon on insulator and FinFET technologies will perform in high radiation environments. We need to find solutions to improve radiation tolerance in digital and mixed signal electronics including ASICs and FPGAs, and also in complex heterogeneous microsystems. One solution is to completely avoid operating in high radiation environments, but that's not realistic. Shielding is a valid, if cumbersome, approach. Past approaches to mitigating radiation effects have fallen into three categories. Radiation hardening by architecture implements multiple levels of redundancy at the component board, subsystem, and platform level using conventional commercial electronics, but that increases overhead and system swap. Radiation hardening by design implements redundancy and protective features at the circuit layout level and adds error detection and correction circuitry, but that increases chip area and power consumption. Radiation hardening by process employs specific materials and processing techniques at the device level in a dedicated rad-hard foundry fabrication line. But dedicated rad-hard foundries do not exist at the advanced CMOS nodes. 
And after we figure out how to build complex heterogeneous mixed signal radiation tolerant electronics, especially at the advanced nodes where ICs can have as many as 60 billion transistors, we're going to need to develop new methods for test and verification to evaluate the reliability of our microelectronic systems in high radiation environments. Lots of good work to be done. Normal military electronics are expected to operate reliably from minus 55 to 150 C, or roughly minus 70 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. The lowest known natural temperature on Earth, minus 89 C, was recorded in July 21, 1983 at the Soviet Vostok Station in Antarctica. The highest known natural temperature recorded on Earth, 57 degrees C, was recorded on July 10, 1913 in Death Valley, California in the United States. Can MTO get even more extreme than that? Sure. It's well known that lowering the operating temperature can improve the speed and performance of digital logic. We've seen work on directly cooling standard room temperature CMOS to liquid helium and liquid nitrogen temperatures, mainly for quantum computing interface circuits. But a recent demo of a 7 nanometer node processor in liquid nitrogen achieved only a 25% performance over power improvement. The MTO Low Temperature Logic Technology Program will develop a 14 nanometer CMOS transistor specialized for operation at 77K which is almost minus 200 degrees C. We expect that LTLT will demonstrate a factor of 25 improvement in performance and power compared to room temperature operation. On the other end of the temperature scale, oil and gas wells can breach temperatures exceeding 200 C. Emerging research on hypersonic vehicles shows that the nose cone and wings heat up to over 1800 C at Mach 5 and the inside of a modern jet engine can get even hotter than that. We can't get the best performance out of these systems if we can't build sensors, communications, and control circuitry for them. Why can't we do that now? High temperature operation leads to failure mechanisms such as dielectric breakdown, electromigration of metal lines in the circuits, and thermal mechanical failures. Increasing temperature adversely affects parameters such as leakage current, carrier mobility, current gain, and threshold and saturation voltages in the device. Still, specialized silicon on insulator transistors have been demonstrated at temperatures up to 300 degrees C. Wide band gap semiconductors such as silicon carbide, gallium nitride, and even diamond have the requisite material properties for high temperature operations but are limited to laboratory demonstrations by the materials and integration beyond the semiconductor itself. For more detail on the state of the art, be sure to visit the Extreme Environment Sensors section of Exhibit Hall East. Thermally hardened electronics need new device topologies and new materials and strategies for integration and packaging to withstand extreme environments. But not all extreme environments occur outside of the electronics. Let's talk about high power. For high power systems, the power supply is often as large or larger than the electronics. High voltage lets you transfer high power at low current, which reduces ohmic losses and joule heating. That's why we use high voltage to distribute power in the electrical grid. And it's also beneficial for electric vehicles. For example, the Tesla Model S battery runs at 375 volts. High voltage also is used in vacuum tubes to accelerate electrons. But in all of these applications, dielectric breakdown is a challenge, as is arcing, which drives thicker dielectrics and larger separation between conductors. High current is used for generating large magnetic fields, like in superconducting electromagnets. It's used for arc welding, where you need the high current to deliver power to low resistance materials like metal and it's used in wide band gap power amplifiers. For these applications, thermal management of the power distribution system is the issue. High power has both high voltage and high current and is used for long range radar, directed energy, and electronic warfare. As systems get smaller and more distributed, the need for compact high power supplies grows, but there are numerous challenges to achieving high power in a compact form factor. There are materials challenges, 
such as thick epitaxial silicon carbide capable of holding off tens of kilovolts, new magnetic materials that can operate at high frequency with low loss and high thermal conductivity, and electrically insulating dielectrics with high thermal conductivities capable of operating in tight packages under sustained power loading. There also are modeling and simulation challenges. We lack the comprehensive computational multi-physics tools to enable the co-design end-to-end of a power supply to optimize size, weight, and power, electrical, thermal, and mechanical performance. The bottom line is that we need to develop new devices that can control high voltage, high current, and high power, along with high breakdown insulating materials and low loss passive components, and the design software that enables us to reduce the research to practice. The start of ERI 2.0 is the time to take on these challenges. So today I'm announcing the new Extreme Environment Electronics Thrust Area. MTO will continue the dialogue with our partners from academia, government, and defense and commercial industry to tackle the hard problems and create microelectronic systems that can operate reliably and robustly anywhere and everywhere they're needed. Enjoy day two of the ERI Summit and MTO Symposium. Beginning now is a technical leadership panel moderated by Dr. Sanjay Rahman, Dean of the College of Engineering, University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Okay, welcome everyone to the DARPA ERI Summit uh, technology panel. So our, our focus today is on 3D heterogeneous integration. Uh, we have a uh, extremely distinguished panel uh, to share their perspectives on this area with you. Uh, first of all, my name is Sanjay Rahman. I am the Dean of Engineering at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, perhaps more importantly for this, uh, for this panel, uh, I spent a number of years at DARPA uh, and one of, the, uh, one of the program portfolios that I was responsible for launching was the Diverse Accessible Heterogeneous Integration uh, Program. And uh, obviously, heterogeneous integration has been a, uh, and 3D technology have been very key areas of investment for DARPA and for the Microsystems Technology Office in particular over the years. Um, and so I think we're going to hear about today uh, the directions uh, those technologies are taking. And, and certainly, I want to acknowledge the, uh, the leadership and investment of DARPA and DARPA MTO uh, in, in leading this industry forward, particularly in the aerospace defense area. So. First of all, let me uh, introduce our panel. Uh, first of all, we have Jeremy Adams. He's the Vice President of Products and Services at Micros Corporation, at, where he heads up all Micros divisions related to 3DHI, including advanced solutions and wafer level interconnect packaging, test, and qualification that Micros utilizes in custom solutions, as well as standard product portfolios. We also have uh, Professor Mohanad Bakir, uh, he is the Dan Fielder Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Georgia Tech, and he directs the Integrated 3D Systems Labs at Georgia Tech. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Raja Swaminathan. He is a Senior Fellow and Advanced Packaging Leader at Advanced Micro Devices, or AMD. So I, I want to welcome uh, all of our panelists. We really appreciate you um, stepping up to uh, participate in this panel, and I'm looking forward to a really, really great discussion. So before we uh, get into the, the meat of the panel, I thought we, I would just level set a little bit on some uh, 3D and HI terminology that we are, uh, you know, that we are going to sort of base our discussion on. Um, obviously, there are a lot of different ways of slicing and dicing this technology. There's a lot of terminology out there. Uh, I don't really intend this to be an exhaustive uh, representation of all the possible technologies and all the possible directions, but sort of in a sort of in a big uh, big picture sense, um, I think we can uh, kind of look at three primary areas that um, that 3D uh, HI can take on. Um, first of all, the sort of quote unquote system in a package, and this is really you know chip stacking types of methodologies where the chips are interconnected via. Uh, wire bonding technology, or flip chip, or EGA arrays, or other type, um, other types of interconnect strategies, but really stacking of chips uh, within some larger uh, uh, packaging uh, system. 
And then we have the very well-known 2.5D uh, integration uh, approach, which is really some sort of interposer or set of bridging, uh, bridging chip technologies uh, that um, interconnect different chiplets or different dialects um, that could be of diverse technologies or they could be all of one flavor. Um, uh, and those interposers connect, interconnect, or include interconnect layers and potentially also passives and, and other uh, supporting electronic co uh, components like um, power supplies or, or power regulation type uh, architectures. And finally, there's sort of this uh, 3D IC uh, concept, um, which are really multiple tiers, which are uh, bonded together through some sort of bonding strategy. Uh, this can be done at the wafer level or it could be done at the, at the chiplet level. Uh, but really, we're talking about um, active device tiers that are sandwiched together between interconnect layers, um, some of which are native to the original wafer that those, that those um, active layers are fabricated on. Uh, these could be face-to-face -face, or these could involve TSVs. Certainly, if you're going to do more than two uh, layers, you're going to have to have some sort of a TSV or through silicon via structure uh, to make that happen. Uh, finally, um, we're using the terminology heterogeneous integration here to really refer to diverse microsystems technology. So that can include different types of silicon electronics, 3.5 electronics, photonics, um, MEM, sort of the, the gamut of more than more technology. We used to say at DARPA uh, in the early days of, uh, of the Cosmos and DAHI programs, best junction for the function. So what, can, what, what is the high performance technology to make something happen? Certainly heterogeneity is also used to refer to different um, system level uh, components like different um, parts of the computing architecture, memory versus processor versus accelerator that can be, you know, that can be, you know, heterogeneous architectures. Um, that's another way of defining it, but we're going to be more broad and talk about different technologies or different types of um, uh, technologies, microsystem technologies. Um, and finally, we use the term uh, device level heterogeneous integration to talk about uh, the heterogeneous integration of devices really at the same uh, same interconnect length or the same order as the, the native devices on that subframe. So uh, with that framing, I'm now going to turn it over to each individual panelist to spend a few minutes to talk about the state of the art from their perspectives. So um, let's move to the next slide. And let me turn it over to Jeremy, uh, who's going to talk about the, the state of the art from my process perspective. Thank you, Sanjay, and, and thanks to all the folks at uh, DARPA for, for making this happen, as well as the invitation to, to join this panel. Really appreciate it. Uh, from a Micros perspective, we're, we're looking at this as a bit of an integrator uh, slash uh, funnel of, of many solutions that uh, we live in naturally. Uh, so. So we look at this from as much of a holistic picture as possible in that it's not just about putting together the components, uh, but what we're going to do with it after it's integrated as a 2.5D or 3D structure and, and, and what do we do on the test and interrogation of the parts such that it survives the intended use case. So if we just start at the left in the wafer level processing, uh, you know, really the core of our 3DHI comes from, from many years of developing technologies for through silicon vias, multiple different bump technologies, silicon interposers. And so you see just a few uh, different scenarios where we've done every type of, of via insertion, vias first, middle, last, what have you, um, in, in multiple uh, silicon, SIGI, uh, other, other 3.5 materials and, and more and more as we get into photonics integration, uh, we really see that as, as, the, uh, as the, the drive forward on the, the high data rate side of, of things with 3DHI. Uh, you look at the wafer level packaging and, and some, of those, some of those examples come out with the deep trenching that needs to, to come into play. So there's, there's a lot of things beyond just putting the interconnect together, but actually as we drive into marrying together both electronic components, photonics, MEMS, um, you know, these these all have their, their challenges when you start looking at doing this at a wafer level. Um, and then just the, the tight pitch micro bumping. So, you know, for the past, you know, two decades, we've been, we've been exposing sub 20 micron uh, pitches. And, and that's more of a question in, 
in my mindset and in you know our team as well as to you know getting that more um, broad based rather than being able to show these on on very select vehicles uh, so you see some of these examples whether it's copper pillar with the with the tin cap or you know copper to copper bonding gold to gold bonding down in the 10 and, and even sub 10 micron in in some cases but um, a lot of that comes down to there's so much flexibility and and as with all new technologies there is no standards right you know the the standardization hasn't evolved yet so you have to uh, you have to funnel that into what's what's useful versus what's possible um, driving into the packaging and assembly you see some of the components and we just chose to show those as their individual pieces on that top image such that you can see that in instead of just looking at cross sections of what they might look like once they're put together um, so you can you can see how part of this challenge of two and a half d versus 3d if we have things that are coming off of different foundries that can be forced into similar sizes going straight 3d and, and going full vertical is rather uh rather straightforward uh, however when you're building a system most of those devices are going to have their own unique shapes and challenges coming off of the foundry so each one of those have to be have to be uh have to be managed and then like i said before you know there's a there's a throwback to some some classical um you know hermetic packaging and again that's that's the point of whether we're going into you know high data rate systems big large power systems or uh, or arrays for for you know phased array or things of that nature, you still have to go and put it into something, whether that's a hermetic package, a plastic uh, interposer to take it down to the board, or even embedding it into the board itself. You still have to manage that, manage all the stresses that relate to that, and then we get into the test and reliability of how much integration can we put into a reliable solution that's both reliable and scalable with enough test data points such that we get to the next level integration with a with an acceptable yield for the mission that that we're going after so you know if we if we don't develop the the probe solutions in conjunction with the the bump pitches then um, then we're just faced with a, a lot more pain when you get to the higher level integration so dealing with the dealing with the you know, wafer level testing and reliability testing there, I think is, 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 you know, one of the key challenges. Once we get all these things put together, are they still deployable into the mission that we're going into? So it's a little uh, quick, but <laughs> we'll share, save some time for everybody else too. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Jeremy. Why don't we advance to the next slide and we will um, next hear from uh, Mohammed at uh, Georgia Tech. Thank you, Sanjay, and thank you to the DARPA team for this opportunity to present and be part of this panel. Uh, so the, <clears throat> yeah, at the Georgia Tech Integrated 3D Systems Lab, we pursue 2.5D 3D technologies accounting, signaling, power delivery, and thermal challenges. And this is done through both modeling and um, experimental demonstration. Here on this slide, I show three different examples being pursued in our lab. In the first, we seek to form a concatenation of electronic and photonic components at the package level. This is done using stitch chips. Stitch chips are, in the simplest form, uh, ICs that are placed above the package substrate to provide high density and low energy communication between neighboring dots, for example, memory and logic. The stitch chip can be active or passive depending on the application. When it's passive, it can be made out of silicon or fused silica, for example. In order to um, in order to enable robust assembly between these stitch chips and the uh, the various chiplets, for example, we utilize compressible micro interconnects, which are pressure based contacts, and allow us to really uh, mix and match a wide array of chiplets and stitch chips, irrespective of their thicknesses, irrespective of the materials that they're made out of, and irrespective of the patent methodology. And we also envision being able to integrate photonic chiplets directly to the logic die to enable massive 
off-chip bandwidth using these compressible uh, micro interconnects as shown in the figure. We also envision using a fiber aligning and interconnection chiplet to simplify the assembly process of how do you bring a large array of fibers and connecting that directly to a photonic integrated circuit at the package level. Unlike you know, common interposer technology solutions, this solution is not reticle size limited and actually can be implemented on any packaging substrate because the stitch chips reside directly on the surface of the package. In our lab, we're also pursuing 3D IC technologies with embedded microfluidic cooling. The key feature of our research in that area is the utilization of dense um, through silicon vias that are directly integrated within the microfluidic cooling structures. Of course, cooling is a grand challenge in 3D technology and being able to integrate, for example, microfluidic cooling in each tier allows you to overcome thermal challenges in 3D interconnects. Uh, these TSVs are, of course, used to provide inter-tier signaling and power delivery from the package to the stack itself. We have demonstrated the benefits of this microfluidic cooling technology using a 2.5D integrated circuit where the center die is a 40 nanometer FPGA and is surrounded by multiple uh, transceiver die. And using our monolithic demonstration on this um, package, we were able to show significant improvement in the um, throughput density of this um, cooling solution compared to a state-of-the-art, let's say, air-cooled heat sink or liquid cold plate. And then lastly, what we're also looking at is polylithic 3D ICs. And what that involves is really being able to integrate heterogeneous chiplets directly in the back end of the line of an integrated circuit. The, the salient feature of this work is really to try to bridge the gap between what monolithic 3D ICs can achieve, which is namely very high density I.O., and what TSV-based 3D technology achieves, which is really the mix and match and heterogeneous nature. And so being able to bring chiplets directly into the back end of the line and using some unique assembly techniques we've developed we can attain the very high density connectivity that is normally enjoyed in monolithic 3D uh, processes, but still with the flexibility of being able to bring in materials and devices and, and structures that are just simply not amenable typically to uh, monolithic processes. And lastly, what I would like to do is really acknowledge the sponsors for this research, which includes the Air Force Research Labs, National Science Foundation, DARPA, and the SRC, Jump Ascent Center for the work shown in this slide. Thank you. <clears throat> awesome. Thanks, Mohanad. Uh, next slide, please. And so let me turn it over to Rajma uh, to uh, talk about the AMD perspective. Uh, looks like there's a bit of animation in these slides, so um, we'll need to, um, I think Rajma just let, the, uh, let us know when you want to advance. Sure. Thanks for the introduction, Sanjay. Uh, we introduced our 3D chiplet architecture at Computex earlier this year, and we followed followed it up with a deep dive on the packaging architecture and implications at hardships a few weeks back. So what we're going to do is compare our copper-based 3D architecture to the current best-in-class solder-based microbomb 3D architecture. Solder-based microbomb technology with tall TSVs is based on traditional solder-based approaches and can scale from 50 micron to about 36 micron and maybe a bit lower and is okay for low bandwidth applications. If you click, go on the next page. AMD's 3D chiplet architecture, as shown to scale related to the microbomb technologies, by contrast, uses silicon fab-like manufacturing methods with back-end design rule-based TSVs with copper-only interconnects without the presence of a solder. Copper-based interconnects is a transformational point in the industry's advanced packaging journey that we are developing with TSMC, where interconnect technologies are now being enabled using silicon fab-based techniques to enable extreme bandwidth applications. As a result of this extreme scaling, we are also able to achieve more than 3x higher interconnect energy efficiency, more than 15x higher interconnect density, as well as better signal and power performance compared to Micropump 3D architectures. And we believe this is the future of 3D packaging. If you go to the next page.
and this is also an animation. So today's demonstration of uh, three D stacking over CPU cores is the so is the beginning of our journey, really. And the future of three D stacking is really going to be a function of TSE pitch and can spawn many architectural innovations, including just build it up for the full slide, please. We can envision architectures where you stack IP on IP, macro on macro, IP folding and splitting, as well as circuit level slicing. And it's a direct function of how fine we can go in TSC pitch. Today, we are starting off at nine micron pitch, but industry-wide there's an effort to shrink the pitch even further. And what this allows you to do is 3D stacking technologies, along with other advanced packaging technologies that uh, Mohana and Jeremy talked about, 2, 2D, 2.5D, 2.XD, will enable the beyond Moore's law scaling in this decade and will enable complex heterogeneous integration architectures that are not possible with monolithic schemes. So I think, as I noted earlier, this is a transformational point in the industry's uh, heterogeneous integration capabilities. Thanks. Thanks, Raja. So um, we can go to the next slide. So what we're going to do now is uh, move into a uh, panel discussion. I think we can uh, close the slides and uh, just do um, basically a fireside chat with uh, with our um, esteemed uh, panelists. So I'll uh, you know I'll um, offer a few uh, uh, topics, questions of discussion. Um, but I, I think the hope is to, you know, to be um, interactive uh, as possible. So certainly panelists, feel free to interact with each other and, um, you know, bounce ideas off each other as we, as we go through the discussion. Um, uh, I will, I'll probably prompt one of you to, you know, to maybe start off the discussion on a particular, particular area and then we can, you know, see how the, see how the conversation goes. So, so um, I, I guess let me start off by, um, you know, I think it's very interesting. Um, I would say the, the um, a lot of what you all have talked about is, is either chip or die stacking or two and a half D inter some sort of intertoser strategy or some sort of, um, you know, interconnect strategy between chiplets. Um, I know when, you know, in my days at DARPA, we were really trying to get to wafer scale you know, platforms, wafer scale integrations, a number of, you know, 3D, um, 3D integration types of programs, wafer bonding, et cetera. Um, what, what do you think's holding that back? Maybe I'll, I'll ask Jeremy to weigh in uh, first. What, what, what's holding back or is there a future for sort of wafer scale um, uh, 3D heterogeneous integration? Yeah, so, so I think there, there are a lot of applications where 3D is going to going to make a lot of sense and, and kind of like I said in, in my slides, it really comes down to what you're trying to do. So the applications where you have a lot of, uh, of similar components, even though it's heterogeneous, um, trying to go wafer to wafer bonding, they lend itself well to going through silicon vias and being able to match the die sizes. You know, something as simple as that, matching the exact die size from from wafer foundry to wafer foundry, right? Um, so, so that for that type of application, it's it, it's pretty straightforward, um, although with its challenges on the actual execution of bond debond um, and and stacking more than you know most of the three Ds that you're seeing are two maybe three high, going much higher than that um, gets to be a, a, a bit of a stack up of of uh, constraints. Uh, so that's where I think you see more and more. Um, you know, two and a half D, and and maybe you have the silicon interposer, and you do have some three D on top of the silicon interposer to take advantages of things like memory or putting a putting a whole bunch of uh, our management chips on another portion of that silicon interposer. Um, you know, then you look at the the applications that are are just trying to go for absolute you know volume scale. They have to get wafer to wafer bonding to work. Again, those are going to be decisions that now they're going to be loaded to that, in my opinion, two or three high uh, type of scenarios where where they can manage those 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 uh, choke points in the uh, supply chain. Um, and then, of course, there's just the the ecosystem too, right? So there's there's things in the commercial space that can be done relatively easy. Where in the defense space we've we've got to all work together and, and build that ecosystem out, um, you know some of the some of the things where the through silicon vias can be more streamlined with 
with additional funding, um, things as simple as as being able to take the back end of line of the latest nodes have to be at 12 inch. So you know a bit uh, a bit biased on on my front, but for our, our wafer bumping, you know we need three 300 millimeter capability. Otherwise, we can do demonstration vehicles at a high yield loss, um, and, and some of those lower rate productions don't don't have that problem. But to truly scale it, we've got to get there. I, I can add to it, Sanjay. I think uh, what Jeremy hit on is actually very important. Wafer scale integration, uh, in concept, it, it is it is pretty good, but I think it comes down to the right architecture and design uh, enablement. Uh, I think the point Jer Jeremy made was the die sizes have to be identical, or it has to be a multiple of the of the the base die to be able to do a, to even envision a stacking process. So what I think is probably going to happen is more like chip on wafer kind of integration approaches, chip on wafer, chip on reconstituted wafer, you name it. That is probably going to be a, a big push moving forward. And the wafer on wafer also has other disadvantages in terms of uh, how much redundancy you're putting into the base design. Because if you don't have redundancy, you're going to have significant yield loss. So on paper, it may look like a great approach, but end of the day, it may not scale. Because if your top uh, wafer is yielding at 80% and your bottom wafer is yielding at 80%, your effective yield is only 64%. And that's not a very scalable process. So I think it's there is a lot more nuance in terms of wafer, wafer level integration that it really comes down to what architectures are we putting in place, what are the design methodologies, how high yielding those wafers are, that's where it comes down to. And as an example, image sensors, for example, they are doing wafer on wafer stacking because they have a lot of redundancy built into it and the designs are pretty simple. They are high yielding designs. You can't think of a CPU to CPU stacking at that level at this point. Yeah, no, that's 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 totally fair. And I think you know, obviously, one of the arguments is um, is latency, right? Like the theory is that you're going to have very very dense interconnect if you do this 3D IC uh, architecture. But um, if you're achieving you know sub nine micro, you know sub nine micron sort of um, you know pillars, uh, you're getting to a, you know you're, you're getting to a pretty good place in terms of uh, density. Yeah. Mohammed, and I think I would just add. Yes, no, thank you. I think uh, Jeremy and Roger made some great points. You know, I think, you know, one of the things that's driving wafer scale integration or wafer scale kind of more processing uh, and bonding is really very fine pitch TSVs. So there's some work out there where people are looking at nanoscale TSVs. And for that, you know, sort of uh, processing and assemblies, you really need a wafer scale level type approaches. Moreover, as we scaled out TSV, um, uh, pitches, you know, alignment between tiers becomes particularly important, and this is where kind of wafer to wafer bonding has some benefits in terms of alignment accuracy compared to flip chip bonders. But I, I think you know everything that has been said you know, by Jeremy and Raja is, is really spot on, and I think ideally we, we get there, but there's some major challenges ahead. That's a, that's a great point too, Mohanad. Uh, if I have to get to let's say sub one micron pitch for, on the architecture that I just described. Today's technologies will not let me do a chip on wafer. I have to go to a wafer on wafer. But then it would be a discussion on whether I can take the yield loss for the product and still go down that path, or are there other ways of skinning the cat by lo doing a loser pitch? I think that is the trade off that we as an architect architect community go through on a daily basis. Yeah, and, and if I may add to Raj's comment, you know. The yield loss is a, a, certainly an important one, and truthfully, it's also an important one even in two and a half D architectures today. I mean, you know, before you assemble, let's say, your 10 or 20 chiplets, because there's really no rework that you can do, you really need to make sure that you, you're assembling your best chiplets that you have at your hand. And so today, because when you do things at the chiplet level, you can sort of do, I think, what Raj is alluding to, and that is you can do a lot of potentially testing and sort out the good from the bad chiplets. But at the wafer scale, you're just stuck, right? It's a luck of the draw. If you have a bad die on top of a you know, good die, unfortunately, the outcome is, is not a you know, positive yield. Yeah, hey, Jeremy, could you, um, because of your test background, could you weigh in on the kind of no good, no, no good die question in this whole sort of story as well? Or maybe you were about to say that. <laughs> 
no, no, that, that, that was a very good uh, segue. So, um, yeah, no, so so absolutely, known good die. Everybody's got their own definition, and I, I think we've done every every version of it going way back into the 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 KGD conferences from from many decades ago. Um, but you know, I think the only other the only other thing that we can throw at of you know massive interrogation at the chiplet level or at the wafer level. Uh, when you're talking wafer to wafer bonding, is now how much repair you can actually build into the particular chip you're looking at, right? So for memory chips, that's pretty easy. For some of the some of the optical chips and 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 uh, high speed linear parts, those are going to be virtually impossible to do. So it's going to depend on what you're trying to stack and which can be the carrier vehicle versus what needs to be the last on top. Um, so you you'll probably see this evolve to where Maybe you can do the first two layers, wafer to wafer bonding, and then you go into wafer accepting chiplets on top of that as well, right? So, again, it's it's going to be a long road. That, that is an excellent point, Jeremy, also. I think that you hit, hit the nail again, right? It's really the architecture that matters. The process capabilities are all there. It's really uh, how do we best utilize the given processes to develop the best design and architecture for highest years? Maybe there are programs where yield is not a big concern. I, I just sh shoot purely for performance. And maybe I go away from the approach there at sub one micron pitch. But for mainstream products, maybe not. It's one of those trade off discussions that as a community we need to have. Well, let's let's move on. Um, so while, while I have you, Raja, we, so we've been talking a lot about chiplets and known good die and, and so forth. Could you comment a bit about sort of the Let's say the design ecosystem. Or, you know, what do you what do you do in house versus what do you do in collaboration with the broader you know broader ecosystem in terms of um, you know chiplets. You know, the DARP had the chips program, for example, which really had the idea of different you know different um, uh, performers being able to deliver chiplets that do different things and being able to synthesize that. How much of this ecosystem is sort of internal to you? How much of it is um, different, you know, different, uh, different um, companies delivering different chiplets, and then going to, you know, Micros, let's say for, for, you know, for in for integration. So maybe you all can, uh, you know, comment on sort of that that chiplet ecosystem. That that is actually an excellent question, Sanjay. I, the firstly, let me say that uh, no single company can do it on its own. It does take a, a village to to drive this forward, especially. Uh, an architecture is so complex as 3D chiplets, as well as putting it together in a package and a system. It does take a, a village to enable the broader chiplet ecosystem. It starts off with uh, the fabulous companies, the OSATs, and the foundries, the tool vendors, like let's say the Applied and the Lamb Research of the world, EDA providers, uh, Synopsys, Answers, where we specifically develop a certain die to die. Uh, IPs with some of those providers, and whereas some of the data IP can will actually be more internal and we contain internally because that is where the quote unquote IP resides, right? Uh, not everything can be shared with everyone in the ecosystem. So there is probably going to be a line where we do this. And there's also the other aspect of how do we enable a larger set of toolbox items in terms of test, like the MBIST, SCAM, Fuses, functional capabilities, and how do I code it with a sort of a design tool checker methodology? I think that that's where I think the ecosystem actually really has to step in and and sort of deliver. Um, so long story short, I think some IP will be contained internally to specific fabulous and design companies, but a lot of it is really uh, the whole ecosystem coming together. Yeah, no, I'd agree with with uh, a lot of what Raja said as well. Um, you know. Any any company can put together a, a, a PowerPoint and show it all work just fine, right? <laughs> so, uh, but actually Academic putting it in really good at that. Well, it, it, it's all has, has to start with the ideas, right? So, so those are those are powerful, uh, but then we actually have to put those into application. And and right now we're we're talking about how do we put together all of those processes? Certainly, Micros doesn't own own fabs for a reason, and, and those are large investments. So we all have to figure out where we sit in that ecosystem and make sure that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're all driving towards the same goal, which is putting putting the most advanced 
ICs, the most advanced systems, into our warfighters' hands such that they can deploy them and they're reliable. And, and right now we're talking about going up, you know, technology curves, you know, for manufacturing readiness level and, and technology readiness level. Uh, you, you know, we're, we're not even getting into where the, uh, where the uh, environmental um, considerations come into, and, and I think that's going to be key as well, right? So, you know, as the systems are changing and the deployments of technologies are changing and, and, and rapidly accelerating, that's, uh, that, that helps, but it also makes us look at the, the ways that we look at physics of failure and is this, is this going to exceed the lifetime of this deployment, which may only be a handful of years versus decades uh, from some of the traditional space. Yeah, so I, I was a little bit being humorous about academia, but Mahan, how do you see, you know, um, university research sort of feeding into this, this ecosystem? How do we get some of the, some of the uh, innovative technologies that universities are developing or, or um, government labs, for example, are developing in, into this ecosystem? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, this is an incredibly important one. Um, you know, to be candid, I think what we need at the academic side is we really need a large-scale national center focus on heterogeneous integration. And this is a center that I believe should bring in the architects, you know, as we just stated earlier, circuit designer, as well as the technologists, including electrical engineers, material scientists, and chemists. I think there are some really grand challenges in heterogeneous integration, and I think only by putting in people with really these different diverse expertise can you really invent the next set of technologies that are going to take us, you know, or give us the next 10x or 100x improvement. I mean, in fact, on this point, I, you know, I would like to say that, you know, today, right, you know, hybrid bonding, of course, is a very hot topic. Interposer is a hot topic. Do I have the bridge chip technology? But, I mean, to be candid, a lot of these technologies were known some 20 years ago, right? I mean, there's papers on it in the academia and certainly by industry and national labs. So, you know, it, for me, it's really exciting, right, to see technology that when I was in grad school was just coming up and now it's actually making the production. It's incredibly exciting. But it also really makes me wonder, right, I mean, where where here in, in, the, in the U.S., right, do we have this critical mass that's looking at the next generation of heterogeneous integration technologies that will give us, again, the next 10 or 100 or maybe beyond X improvement. Um, but, you know, the good news here, right, is the Semiconductor Research Corporation and DARPA are masters at this. You know, 20 years ago, they funded this Interconnect Focus Center research program here at Georgia Tech under Professor Jim Weindel. And that center was very much devoted towards heterogeneous integration and hyper-integration. And I would argue, to be candid, that some of the technologies and know-how developed in that center 20 years ago has made its way and influenced the way we do things today. And so today um, there is a center called Ascent, again funded by SRC. And, uh, you know, as part of this effort, there's certain look at um, looking at HI, but to be candid, I think we need a much bigger effort and scope looking at this. Also, from an academic side, I think we need to sort of infuse more education, uh, you know, more course, more coursework for at the undergraduate level and the graduate level in this area. And I think updating some of our lab with the latest, you know, um, fab and assembly capabilities so that we give our graduate students and undergraduate students access to the latest tools and access to the know-how of what is needed to make these um, unique uh, technology so that hopefully when they go to industry, right, they can immediately contribute uh, not only from an execution point of view, but hopefully bring in some fresh, fresh perspective. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the, the focus centers and the, uh, you know, the NSF Engineering Research Center program. I think a key element of, um, uh, of these centers is really got to be um, engagement with industry. So there have to be industry partners in, in these centers. Um, they have to be at the table driving sort of the, you know, the translational or the lab to market sort of perspective. So maybe, maybe, I don't know if Jeremy and Roger, do you want to just very quickly, you know, what are, what are some things that, you know, that you, you would like to see coming out of university uh, research um, and, 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 you know, experiential education that would be helpful to you? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Sanjay. I think uh, Mohanad uh, brought up some good points. The 
let me start off with some of the things that he mentioned towards the rear end of his uh, comment. Uh, AMD particularly, we are extremely uh, interested in bringing undergraduates or graduates for internships so they understand that he, the industry ecosystem as well as the best practices that we have and some of the new technologies that we're developing to sort of not just prepare them for the next stage of their careers, but also sort of seed back to the universities on things that are being done at the industry and how it can actually influence uh, the the research goals of a academia or a university, right? So that's one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is universities in general need to think extremely long term. Um, I've seen uh, some universities uh, and some university-based research consortia trying to solve short-term industry problems, which I think it's best left to for industry to solve, as opposed to uh, as opposed to a, a, a university trying to solve it. They should be focusing on moonshot approaches, right? Uh, as Mohanan mentioned, ten x, hundred x improvements, not focusing on the five percent, one percent improvements here and there. I think that's something that needs to be inculcated all the way tops down uh, in terms of how government agencies fund research programs and how government agencies also take the longer view. Because when I talk to a lot of universities who want research funding from AMD, they're saying, hey, I'll solve your today's problem. My, I go back to them saying, I don't want you to solve my today's problems. I want you to tell me what problems I had to solve five or 10 years from now. I think that's a big disconnect in terms of uh, industry expectations versus government funding and uh, university approach towards those funding goals. Uh, great point. Jer Jeremy, thoughts? Yeah, no, I echo uh, quite a bit of, of what you guys have said as well. Uh, we certainly lean heavily on our internship programs to make sure that when we've got folks coming out that they uh, that they already have their, their feet wet, so to speak, into the problems that, that we're dealing with. But the Raj's point, um, those internship programs are, are really helping us solve, you know, the, the one to three year problems, not the uh, 10 to 20 year problems. Um, and then and then likewise, the, the feedback back into those universities. So each of those sites that we're, we're closest with, we try to make sure that we also have a, a, uh, a good relationship with the, the faculty to, to make sure that they're, they're training for what we need. So while the research uh, going on is, is solving long-term programs, they're also breeding, you know, bridging in that roadmap of the things that we need in the next five years and, and things of that nature. Um, I think it's it, it's also part of that ecosystem, right? Where do we all sit and uh, and making sure that that's that that's well funded at each step of the of, of the way? Because if we don't challenge, if we don't tackle the the near term problems in conjunction with the long term, then the, the gap to jump into those next level solutions they come out with will just be too great. It has to be a stair step method. Awesome, thanks. So uh, let's move on a bit. Um, so I, you know, kind of on this theme of um, what's the next frontier. I mean, we for, for I think for probably a couple of decades, um, DARPA has been really looking at you know can we do silicon three five silicon you know three five photonics uh, you know really mixed heterogeneous integration technologies. Are, are we seeing any of that, um, you know, getting into the commercial or aerospace markets? You know, um, are there are there applications that really could benefit? I mean, you mentioned sort of high speed interconnect, uh, you know, server type, um, you know, high speed, high bandwidth backplanes and that kind of thing. Are there are, are there places where that that really true heterogeneous integration can be impactful? Or what's hold, you know what's holding that back? Maybe maybe Jeremy and Mahan, if you could you both talk a little bit about the aerospace defense and the true you know kind of three five integration side of things too. So maybe you could both weigh in. There. Sure. So just to jump in on on the aerospace 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 and defense uh, applications that we're seeing currently, we're we're absolutely seeing three five technologies going into you know power systems, phased array radars. Uh, high-speed optical interfaces for everything from from the main core compute nodes to to the long throw cables and everything in between, and I think that's that's really the exciting um, applications that that we're seeing where you're getting compute in place of of memory, and then you're you're immediately jumping to a, a photonics 
scale on this to uh, to get the, the the data bus out as, as quickly as possible with as efficient as po uh, power as possible. Um, you know, I think Mohan had also hit on on the the power control quite eloquently in his slides, and, and that's going to be something that we're going to have to to deal with as well um, on on all of these integration solutions as we just congest more and more power into the single concentric node <laughs> that we're uh, trying to do all this compute and storage on. Yeah, so I, I you know, I think Jeremy again uh, brought up a lot of good points and I think certainly, you know, on the the millimeter front end, you know, the integration of, you know, for example, gamma nitride type power amplifiers with silicon electronics, there's a lot of need for heterogeneous integration there and uh, and you know doing it with very low losses uh, in type interconnects. Uh, of course, thermal is a challenge, you know, with, with uh, these high power amplifiers. And so that requires innovative solutions on the digital side. You know, I think, you know, the, the marriage of photonics and electronics is happening today. You know, photonic interconnects, to be candid, has always been the, the technology of the future, but I think it's finally here and you can't really escape it. Um, you know, getting off the package using conventional interconnects is really not an option today. You know, unfortunately, you pay in orders of magnitude and energy and you have orders of magnitude lower bandwidth density when you go off chip versus what you have on chip, right? You know, particularly if you're using a conventional packet. And so I think really the aim of really our, our business that we're in is to blur the boundaries between what's considered on-chip and what's considered off-chip, right? And so for shorter distances, right, I think electrical interconnects are very well accepted to be, you know, the right solution, but for longer interconnect, for longer range um, connectivity, I think photonic offers some unique bandwidth density and energy per bit um, 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 characteristics that you simply cannot escape, I think, anymore. Thanks. Um Roger, can you weigh in? And, and, and also, could, I wonder if you could also touch on, um, uh, I, there's certainly, I think, interest in the DOD, um, perhaps in, in, in the commercial sector as well, about leveraging chiplets for, for security applications, for example, um, you know, um, uh, trusted or, you know, hardware root of trust type of applications where you might have a chiplet that you know, you you have built in a trusted uh, foundry, but you can integrate it using you know using chiplet architectures with, with other stuff that's coming from offshore foundries where you maybe don't have that level of trust. So in the same, maybe a, talk about talk about your perspective on the high bandwidth interconnect, but also I'd be interested in your thoughts on security as well. Okay, so I think um, the the any chiplet approach whether it's security or not i think it first and foremost comes down to what is the bandwidth that is needed to interconnect that chiplet to let's say a main uh let's say an io device or a core compute device and we essentially have to pick architectures based on the interconnect bandwidth latency needed as well as uh, interconnect energy efficiencies because per bit it really comes down to if I can deal with a uh, reasonably moderate bandwidth, I can probably use conventional 2.5D or conventional 3D solutions, or even on-package uh, architectures. Let's not forget um, on-package interconnects like through an organic substrate is still good for most practical applications. And it's going to be there for a long time. People think that when you have 3D, everything is going to go 3D. Uh, that's not the way we look at it. It's going to be a pyramid of options. Only the highest end data interconnects would need a 3D architecture. If I have like terabytes per second bandwidth, which is what we recently announced in our SRAM to CPU interconnect, there's no no other way to do it except by doing a, a hybrid bonded 3D approach. Maybe if I have a lower bandwidth application, maybe a standard 3D approach may be still fine at 50 or 35 micron pitch. And then it gets down to what is the next level of bandwidth uh, that I need and can I do a 2.1D like RDL based architectures, or then the next level would be uh, on package interconnects. And then the last level would be off package or on board. I think where we are at a point, um, and sort of just to chide uh, Mohana, we have been at this point between electrical and optical since I joined the industry, uh, which is about uh, 
17 years now, 16, 17 years. So uh, optics is always here <laughs> and it's never here too. Uh, so it's really going to be a trade-off of how people are going to be pushing copper. Let's not get it, get it wrong, right? People are continuing to push copper because the costs are so low. They're going to continue pushing this for as much as they can. And it really has to have a transition in terms of performance per dollar. Is it worth going to optical? Extreme long reach, of course, there is no other cho choice but to go optical. So that's one part of the equation. And particularly to security, I'm not a security expert, uh, Sanjay, but what I can say is it really comes down to if I have to in integrate a, a quote unquote, a secure enclave IP from a different company or into my package, it really comes down to first question I ask is say, what is the bandwidth? What is the latency? What is the power? Performance per dollar, performance per watt, performance per picojoule per bit will be the key metrics that I'll be looking at to figure out how to piece them together. And of course, when you start talking about uh, integrated security and it also comes down to what is the ecosystem? What is the geography of the ecosystem that comes into play? And is it US government sensitive? And how does it, what is the right uh, ecosystem within the US to be able to do something like that. Today we have, we don't have all those capabilities to Mohanad's earlier point on, there is no integrated center here to be able to pull all of this together. Now, so it, it comes down to a lot of uh, geopolitical as well as uh, how much can I invest within 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 the US too. Okay, great. Yeah, Jeremy, you want to, can you weigh in on sort of the, um, sort of the uh, US government Ecosystem for for maybe more things in the security space. Uh, has maybe sure. How do you guys so handle that? so I think that's 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 one thing that lends itself perfectly in the in the two and a half D and three D integration. Right is is just the 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 generic disaggregation of the IP. Right. So so you can choose things from multiple different foundries, and some of those are going to be key critical. And then the level of interrogation you can do on those for any sort of harmful insertion type of applications for things coming from from uh, non-trusted sources, right? So, you know, while we operate a couple of, of, of trusted sites, um, you know, obviously being able to do those flows are important, but doing a complete trusted flow versus the, the big T, little t approach, and then driving towards the zero trust approach going forward uh, this this gives you a lot of tools in the toolbox to to be able to accomplish a lot of that, um, and then again it depends on what's the application, what's the absolute level of scrutiny that this needs to go through for that deployment of of what you're trying to do. Right? Gotcha, uh, Mohammed. Uh, let me give you a, 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 a couple seconds here to respond on the photonic. Uh, interconnect side of things. I mean, it seems to me that, you know, if we're in a, you know, silicon world, um, you know, that, that, that becomes much harder. But if to the, to the extent you can bring three fives into the equation, that, that really opens up some, you know, possibilities on emitters and detectors and things that you, you know, um, optical amplifiers and things that you can't do in a pure silicon um, platform. So, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, for the laser source, right? I mean, laser source integration is a big challenge, and I mean, certainly that's where you would need you know, three, five type materials. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the nice thing is really, you know, we leverage the silicon photonics. So, we, you know, uh, founders like Global Founders, right? They're spinning out uh, wafers with silicon photonic devices, meaning modulators and detectors, and these are being you know, integrated at the package level using two and a half D type architectures today. And I, and I think, you know, there are applications where again, you know, the key thing when you talk about photonics is distance, right? And so when, when the distance, right, is, is, is something you cannot meet with electrical, I think you will have to transition to photonic. Absolutely. Okay. Great. So we're, we're getting close to the end of our time uh, together here. Um, maybe I'll, I'll uh, just um, put one parting question on the table, which I think particularly would be interesting uh, for, for DARPA to hear. Um, and, and that's where should the government and the DOD invest from your perspective in, the, in moving forward for sort of that 10 year out horizon. Um, I think we've heard a little bit about that already, but maybe you could each, you know, Jeremy, 
um, Han and uh, Roger, you know, just go through and, and, and give us your thoughts on, on what the government and DOD can invest in that would make it. I'll yeah. jump in. Um, I think it's got to be a balanced approach, obviously. Uh, you know, we've talked about the ecosystem and, and, and really where we have uh, certain challenges that are more near term than, than long term. The, the, the overarching thing is, uh, of all of this is that the, the 3D integration is coming. It's not going to serve every solution, whether it's cost or volume type of scenarios, but for those scenarios that absolutely have to uh, have the either the compute node, the, the data rate, or the power dissipation, um, you know, those are going to demand this. And, and really keeping that balance between we can design what we build, we build what we, we can design, and, and all of those, if they don't fit the mission, um, isn't, isn't going to be uh, helpful to anyone in the end. So I'm a little biased on, on, on where. Uh, so, so obviously I'm, I'm uh, painfully aware of our, our, our 300 millimeter challenge on the back end of line. And in, I think for the broad uh, ecosystem, that is one bottleneck that is not a 10 year problem. It's a, it's a uh, one to three year, maybe even uh, a five year on the long range problem as all of these applications really drive into that. So being able to do the amalgamation of all these components into, into a single system, you have to have that ability to adapt the parts, right? And so what we're giving up with not having things like wire bonds or, or, or flexible interconnects to, uh, to bind all these parts together um, has to be adapted at that you know, back end of line post foundry level. Excellent. Uh, Mohammed, you I think you already sort of weighed in on this national center idea, but you know, other thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I, I if I have a chance I would like to just to echo, I think there is a, a need for, you know, a center here in the US that is devoted to advanced heterogeneous integration that brings in the right people. Um, I think it's important for the workforce development perspective. And I think it's sort of important to help us achieve the next 100x or beyond sort of improvements. I would say also another, you know, potential need really is, you know, I, I commonly hear my colleagues in academia sort of complaining that, you know, they don't have access, right, to these state-of-the-art integration technologies. So, for example, I mean, there's most a service to spin out, you know, circuits, right, but once you have the circuits, your option to really leverage 3D or twin happy type integrations is, is, you know, not as wide as one would like it to be. And so, I mean, almost a Moses-like surface for HI seems to be potentially, um, you know, something that could help the community advance this field even further. And I think I would say the last thing is that a lot of universities have clean room facilities today, right? Certainly at Georgia Tech, we have a you know, fantastic clean room facility where we can really pretty much do you know, everything except, uh, I think, iron implantation. But on the packaging or integration side, I think there's a whole set of other tool sets that, you know, we would love to own, right? And I'm sure other universities would love to own because I think you know, some of these tool sets are a little bit different than what you'd commonly use for silicon type processing. So I hope there's going to be an opportunity where universities can apply for grants to really build up their HI lab facilities to sort of enable advanced research in this area. Roger, I'll give you the last word. Uh, I think the, the National Center uh, that Moh Mohanad was talking about is very, very important. And I think we have been advocating for it. I think there's a lot of emphasis put on uh, enabling a lot more fabs in the US. I think to a certain extent, a lot of that uh, needs to move more towards how do I do heterogeneous integration or more advanced packaging within within the states. Uh, almost an end-to-end -end ecosystem where we could take silicon from different foundries, piece it together, 3D, 2.5D, 2.1D, 2.2D, even down to the extent of building, let's say, a substrate capacity. As most of you are aware, substrate capacity is going to, is the big, single biggest challenge in the ecosystem today. Uh, obviously, it goes through uh, ups and downs, but I think having an end-to-end -end ecosystem where I can do the highest level of data integration, less than one micron pitch, down to a standard substrate or a PCB-like approach, 
within the states, I think is, is solely lacking. And that's something would be a great initiative if some of the bills that are getting through Congress uh, can fund those kind of initiatives and bring people together from uh, companies both within the US and outside because there's a lot of technical capability and uh, and uh, uh, intelligence outside the US. So we should also be open to that in terms of bringing in the right resources to help with this with the center. Okay, that's awesome. I think that's a really great great place to to stop our conversation. Um I really want to thank you uh Jeremy, Muhammad, uh Raja. Uh I think a great conversation. Um you know, I appreciate it. everyone out there who um you know is going to log in and and listen to this discussion. I think there's been some, you know, uh, really interesting thoughts and 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 uh uh, great perspectives here. So thank you uh, all for taking time out of your you know busy schedules to participate in this. And I again want to thank DARPA uh, and MTO for um, for sponsoring this and for really you know uh, uh, for you know I think multiple decades of of leadership in advancing in advancing these technologies. Certainly from the, the aerospace and defense point of view, but uh, obviously the crossover in the commercial you know, commercial sector has been huge as well. So. Thank you all again, um, and uh, you know, uh, good luck to everyone. This begins the morning break. The technical session on mitigating the skyrocketing costs of electronic design will commence at 11:45 a.m.